For today's episode, I have compiled 10 of my most favorite DIY thrift flips of home decor and furniture. So sit back, relax, or DIY right along with me. But let's get started. So my husband finally put his foot down and said, enough's enough. He said, I love you, honey, but something's got to happen about this wood pile. It's gotten way out of control. <laughs> and honestly, he's right. After many multiple projects, my wood pile was going crazy. I'm going to be trying to use up some of the scraps from my wood pile. And the first one is this TV stand. This one was a reject from my recent living room makeover. It's just laminate, not cute. But in order to make this look beautiful, we got to take it outside. So how many of you have something in your house that looks a little like this? It's a very inexpensive TV stand. It's made out of laminate. You can find them in thrift stores everywhere. <laughs> but it just so happens to be the perfect size for an entryway bench. Everything about it is perfect except for the way it looks. It looks cheap. It doesn't look high-end. It doesn't look interesting. It is super boring. We are going to start out by sanding with an electric sander just to make this job go a little bit faster. You can sand by hand if you'd like to. We don't need to worry so much about the top because we're going to cover that up. All right, with this all sanded down, all we need to do is wipe it, get it nice and clean with an old rag, and then let it dry. So now it's time to cut down our scrap ship lap and for that we need to get powerful. Now I don't want you to get nervous because it is my job to help demystify the use of power tools and show you just how usable a miter saw can be. It's not scary, I promise. And it's gonna make your life so much easier. Now, if you don't have a miter saw, that's okay. You could do this with a miter box by hand. It will just take you a little bit more time, but you'll get a nice, awesome workout with your arm. Clearly, I'm not working out. <laughs> so we're gonna measure the distance that we have from the top of the seat to the bottom, and that is 17 and three quarters inch. So we're gonna just go ahead and mark that on our board. and then we're going to cut it. Now I'm gonna be using a sliding compound miter saw. Let me show you how we're gonna do this. First of all, we need to protect our eyes. You can also protect your ears and your face if you like. I would never discourage anybody from protecting themselves. Just make sure that you're able to still move. <laughs> These are dirty. We're just doing some simple straight cuts and the way you turn this on is you put your thumb here, thumb pushes that in, hand pulls this up like so. And that's how you turn it on. It's super easy. So let's do this. <laughs> so then we take our board, we get it lined up with the edge of our blade. So line it up before we pull the trigger and we're gonna cut. And it's as simple as that. Now that we have our board cut, we can write P-A-T on that. And that's just short for pattern. And we can use this one to mark all of our boards. We need a total of 11. Instead of re-measuring every time and maybe the measurements get off, we can just use this one to cut them all with. And that's gonna make our life so much easier. And then cut away, cut, 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 cut. <laughs> While we are already making cuts, I pull out three one by sixes from my scrap pile. Three more pieces of lumber down. Yes! <laughs> I know my husband will be so thrilled. And we cut it to 59 inches, which is the length of our bench. This is going to sit nice and flush on the top, which is perfect because I have something else planned for along the edge. Now it's time to paint. And I first start by taking some spray primer and priming our bench. We don't need to worry about the top again or the back. I left the back on there primarily just to prevent some overspray. Now, this is literally the only part of the painting process that I would do again. <laughs> Because in my mind to save time, I decided to take some black chalkboard paint and 
spray paint the entire bench that way. Boy, was I wrong. Not only was it not a time saver, but it hurt my fingers from holding down the sprayer and it just wasn't a very great finish and it just took forever. But I was stubborn and I saw it through to the end. But honestly, hindsight being 2020, I should have just broken out the regular paint or chalk paint and rolled it on. It would have gone on thicker, more evenly and been just generally faster, which is kind of crazy when you think Think about this is why I was doing this in the first place. So just learn from that from me to just go ahead and roll it. Now, while that was drying, I took Robin Egg Blue spray paint and sprayed our shiplap. I would do this part again because it worked out just fine. I really thought the color was very pretty. It's going to add such a nice, subtle pop of color to the bench. Now, while that was drying, kind of chain reaction going on here, I went ahead and took some antiquing glaze and antiqued our boards for the top part the bench. Then we had a whole lot of stuff drying all at the same time. <laughs> Once the paint was dry, I took a clear coat and sprayed that on as well. Now with our finish done, we can get rid of this. This was just kind of to help protect from a little bit of overspray, and this might be overkill, but how often do you get to use a sledgehammer? <laughs> so I'm gonna knock this out. Yeah. <laughs> we flipped this around and we are gonna install our ship lap reverse. I'm gonna start from the center and move out just so that it's even on either side when we're finished. So we're gonna center this. See how perfectly that fits in there? Do one down here. And then I'm gonna be doing most of mine down from the top. We're gonna drive it from the top. These nails are too long. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run them all the way on the top and then I'm gonna switch out the nails and do shorter ones across. So we switched out to shorter nails and we're gonna do the bottom and then we will measure these end pieces. Here we go. Okay, <laughs> let's talk. I am running out of daylight. This has ended up taking a little longer <laughs> than I thought it would, but I think in the end, it's gonna turn out really amazing. I'm pretty excited. I ran into a couple of issues. There is like on one board where I shot the nails in at the wrong angle and it came through, but in my scrap pile, <laughs> that I am trying to dwindle down. I found some trim, it's usually white, that I spray painted the black and finished. And we are gonna simply just glue that and it's gonna hide our little oops-a-daisy. So no one will ever know, except for all of you, of course, that I made a boo-boo. <laughs> I actually had to run to the store because I didn't have the right length nail to nail this down into place. So while I was picking up nails that were just right, I decided to get some of this trim. I think it's mullion. I don't know, I think it's used for door casing. And what I thought we'd do is just finish it out a little bit more and hopefully not <laughs> add more scraps to our pile. But I figured if we just nailed this into place and then add the same antiquing wax on this, that it would just look beefier and more finished. And then we'll just do some more little finishing touches and then we'll be wrapping this project up. I'm totally obsessed with how this bench makeover looks in the end. It looks so expensive, so nice. This TV stand was totally headed for the thrift store, but the little bit of creativity, some scraps from my wood pile, and a little bit of elbow grease, we turned this cheap looking TV stand into something that I would be proud to have in my entryway. And I love it. It's really cute, but what do you think? 
My next project is a shadow box. It was a simple plain shadow box. I picked it up a long time ago for $2.99 and I've had plans to do something with it for like ever. And now is the time. And what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take some more of that shiplap that we used on the bench and just kind of fill it in the back to kind of give it a little bit more texture and dimension. So I simply line up my shadow box over the top of the shiplap and trace the inside so I know where to make my cuts. I make my cuts on my miter saw. And since it's a compound sliding miter saw, that means it gives it a little bit more length that it can cut. And so I cut it on that because it was a really nice precise cut and then I can flip it around and cut the other side and that makes it really easy a lot simpler than pulling out a circular saw and trying to keep it straight clamping it down so using my miter saw in this situation made it really quick and easy work and then I just took my nail gun and kind of nailed it in the top and on the bottom I didn't do it on the sides just because I didn't want to see the nail holes on the side and I figured it was sturdy enough doing it on the top and the bottom and then I decided it needed a little frame and I had some leftover molding from our bench and so I took some of that and created a simple miter frame around the front of the shadow box. And then it was time to take it back inside where we caulked all of the seams and that would just make it so you don't see the gaps and it also adds a little bit more stability to the piece and then also all of those nail holes and everything we filled those in with some putty and we let that dry. Then we painted the whole box on the outside in a black chalk paint. Now I actually really loved that kind of aqua color and it kind of matched some of my other pieces, but I decided to go with the black only because of the location of where I was gonna be putting it. I have two places where I think that this would work and in both places that Robin Eggs Blue wouldn't work. So I was kind of sad to see that go because I really did like that color, but I was really happy with the black chalk paint. And then of course, we painted out the middle just the the white and look how cute this looks all put together it really elevated a simple box that was kind of boring kind of bland and now it's just been lifted up a little bit and all because of some scrap wood that my husband is super happy is no longer outside I just love how this turned out we've got three to four dollars into this and it looks amazing I love it but what do you think if you're finding value in this episode, I'd really appreciate it if you smash that like button. And if you haven't already, so you don't miss out on some future episodes, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. I'd love to see you around. I'm actually gonna be doing this in a guest bathroom. It's pretty hot and humid right now outside, so I wanna avoid that as much as possible. But you'll notice this beautiful little piece here. This was such an awesome score. So I was driving to a store in another town and on my way, I kind of glanced to the side and I was like, what is that? And it was kind of like this architectural salvage. It looked a little bit like a junkyard, I'm not gonna lie. And I decided I really wanted to check it out. And I ended up getting four pieces of four that we're gonna be doing on this episode from that location. It was a hidden treasure, so I was really excited. Well, I saw this upside down in a pile of chairs. <laughs> and stuff like really high, but I could tell that it was really something special. So I wanted it. I didn't even realize this until I got it home, but I looked underneath and it's an Ethan Allen. I knew it had really good taste. <laughs> so after removing the seat, we take some Briar Smoke Gel Stain, which I will link in the description box and give the whole piece a good coat. 
One of the reasons I like this gel stain is because it's more opaque, making it a lot less work and you don't need to necessarily sand down a piece like you would if you were using a regular stain. So I'm just a huge fan of gel stain. One note I would tell you is when you're getting around the edges of the caning, you might need to go back in with a little paintbrush to kind of get into those little nooks and crannies. Now, after we stain it, we're going to let it dry for a solid 24 hours. Then I really wanted to kind of give it that whitewashed effect that you've kind of seen on similar pieces recently. So I came back in and I mixed some clear wax with white chalk paint. In this case, I used the color called plaster, which is slightly creamier in color. You don't need this much. I kind of over mixed, but I just wasn't sure. And you kind of mix in a one to one ratio. And then we just brush it on and then wipe it off until you're happy with a look. I left it a little thicker in those kind of carved out areas because I really felt like it made them stand out and you could see the design a little bit better. But just apply it in a way that makes you happy. And then while that is drying, we are gonna work on the seat cushion. The first thing we wanna do is we want to remove any of the piping, which was usually a little easier to do in this. And this is why I know Ethan Allen is a well-built piece because I had a hard time getting off the piping, but I have eventually did get it off and then we're going to wrap it and recover it in a new fabric. Now I really love that kind of linen look that you've been seeing on similar pieces like this and I recently came across the most amazing painter's drop cloth off of Amazon which I will link in my description box but I've used a lot of different painter's drop cloths and this is by far the best value for the money because the quality is so much more thick and beautiful looking. There's less seams in in it and just generally an overall higher quality feel to it. Now we are gonna cut off a section and wrap the bottom seat in this fabric and just staple it into place. Now you can see how I go about this. You can see that I start from the middle and you kind of work in a north, south, east, west kind of pattern, making sure that it's pulled out nice and smooth, but not like too tight, but tight enough. <laughs> you don't want to pull too hard. And then once you have a staple on each center area, then you kind of work from the center out to the edges. And then when you get to the corner, you're gonna staple in the corner first, and then you're gonna kind of wrap it like you would a present. Now, if there's a lot of excess fabric, you wanna get rid of some of that bulk, you can take your scissors and kind of cut away some of it prior to stapling, and that way it will just help it lay flatter. I hope that's all making sense. <laughs> personally thought that this seat was just too flat. Now I could have added extra batting and foam and made it a lot more cushy, but instead I thought it would look more high end and be more comfortable if we added an additional cushion on top. So what I did is I took our seat and I used it as a pattern and traced around the outside with a fabric marker. And because of the thickness of the marker, it kind of added an additional half inch seam all the way around. And I doubled up the fabric and cut out two of these, one for like the top and one for the bottom. Then we need to add some thickness. So I also cut out a four inch strip and I didn't actually really measure the length of this, but I made sure that there was plenty for an, an entire circumference of the cushion. And because the fabric tears so easily, I just do that and it also helps it keep it very straight. And then I'm gonna wanna put on piping as well. So I also tear out one and three quarter inch width strips for that. Now that we have everything cut, we are going to now make our cushion. Back in the day, I used to do my piping separately, but I found it's just as easy and a lot less time consuming if I just go ahead and sew the piping on at the same time as I'm sewing it into place. So you can do it in whatever order you like. This is just how I do it and it saves me time. So I line up the edge of our piping fabric with the edge of our seat cushion and I kind of stuff inside the piping and then wrap it around 
as you see me doing here. Now we're going to leave about inch of this piping unsewn and you'll see why in just a second. And then we're gonna just start stitching this piping on all the way around. And then we're gonna stop a couple of inches before we're to the end and make sure our piping cord matches up. And then we can kind of cut off the cord where that is and then we're gonna leave an excess of fabric of about an inch to an inch and a half. And then we're gonna kind of fold that down and kind of wrap it all together so it looks like one continuous piece of cording. Now, I used to kind of just bend them out and kind of crisscross them at the end, but this looks so much more finished and it's actually much easier to sew rather than trying to sew across double layer of crisscrossed cording. I hope that you can see what I'm doing here and that it all makes sense. Now that we have the piping on both pieces, we are going to connect them with that four inch center strip. Now you'll remember we didn't actually measure the length and the reason is, is that I have had that backfire on me in the past and I've accidentally cut it too short and thought it was gonna be right. So I just make sure I have plenty and then I start sewing it on to one side of the piece. And we, again, we're gonna do it similar to kind of what we did with the piping and leave a couple of inches and then start sewing a couple of inches down. And then we stitch all the way around one side until we get to the back and we have a couple of inches on the other side as well. Then you're gonna stop sewing at this point and kind of take some pins and pin where the seam should go in and then sew that seam. Kind of open that seam out flat and then stitch that into place and then you, it should be a perfect fit. For me, this is how I like to do it. Just like I said, I've I cut it too short in the past. I know it's kind of complicated to explain, but I hope that you can see what I'm doing here and that it all makes sense. The last part is probably the trickiest, but totally doable. The most important thing is taking the time to match up the corners so that everything aligns well. And typically I start with the outside corners first and then I go to the middle and then I use plenty of pins or uh, clips in this case. And I love these clips more than the pins just because they are so easy to work with. Now this might take some adjusting, but you want to take the time to do this to make sure that everything is aligned up so that you save yourself some headache later. And then we are just going to sew around the majority of it, leaving an opening in the back so we can stuff in our cushion. And then we're gonna stuff in our cushion. And in my case, I just had an extra feather down pillow on hand that I thought would work perfectly because those feathers are so pliable and they can kind of fill in those little nooks and crannies. It actually worked out great. <laughs> we added a lot of fluff, it's super soft. And then we're just going to pin or clip that seam closed. And then we're gonna take it back to our sewing machine and use a stitch in the ditch technique, which is just kind of sewing extremely close to that seam line, almost so where you can't see and tell that it's there, but you do want to make ultra sure that you catch all of that fabric so it will stay closed. I love this technique because I didn't have a zipper handy, but you could totally add a zipper if you'd want to make it removable and wash it. But for me, for me, I just thought it would be fine. And I typically use a steam cleaner to steam clean things like this anyways, but you do what works best for you. I absolutely adore how this chair turned out. I rescued this chair from the top of a pile of junk, literally, and I paid $35 for it, and then I probably have an additional five to $10 more in supplies. If you were to go into an Ethan Allen store today and buy a similar chair, you can expect that that would cost you around $1,500 to $2,000. And I don't think by revamping ours, we've sacrificed really anything in quality in the end. I just love this end result, but I love the price even more. But what do you think? So it's hot and humid right now, so we're gonna try to do this as quick as possible, but we are gonna be making a, I guess you could call it a coat rack, or you could hang your bags on it, whatever, just, or you could hang jewelry from it. It's a rack. <laughs> I got these at the Habitat for Humanity Restore 
over a year ago and I haven't done anything with them yet. And I've just kind of laid it out here to see how big we want to cut this piece of wood down. Mark that where we think. And then we're gonna make just a straight cut. Because I don't want this board plain, we're gonna put some trim around it. And this is just a one by two and from my scrap pile. We are gonna make a mark. And so the important thing here is that you want the sides to match and the long sides to match. You could do straight cuts, but I really think this will look nicer if we do miters. Now that we've got our one by twos mitered, I'm just going to use a little wood glue and then my nail gun to attach it to our one by six. Then we're gonna give it a good sand down so that everything is nice and smooth and ready for stain. And then we are going to take that same briar smoke gel stain and give it a good coat. While that is drying, we're gonna take those gold curtain tie backs that I found at the thrift store and spray paint them in an oil rubbed bronze spray paint. I also thought it would look really cool in a matte black spray paint as well. So you've got some options there. And then I also spray paint some screws to match. Once everything is dried, I just evenly space out our hooks and screw them into place. Once everything is all assembled, I took it back outside and did a clear top coat in a satin finish. Now it's been a while since I bought these hooks, so I cannot remember the exact amount I paid for them, but they were pretty inexpensive. And then with some scrap wood and a little paint and a little stain, we have a beautiful piece that I can hang outfits on. There's a lot of functionality for something like this, and I hope it gets your wheels spinning for the, something that you could do similar. Not only is this piece very functional, but it's still beautiful in my opinion but what do you think so for our next thrift flip I found like this slate cheese board or charcuterie board at that same kind of nasty place that I found that Ethan Allen chair and I'm telling you it was dirty it was straight up disgusting but we're gonna turn it into something special so the first thing I did was give it a good cleaning now the wood was very dry so I just decided to stain it and I used a darker gel stain this time I used the color Kona and when it was fully dry I took it out and also gave it a good clear coat now my mother loves charcuterie boards. She loves making these types of things and she was coming in town for Mother's Day. So I decided to make this with her in mind. I decided to do something fun to customize the slate piece. Did you know that you can etch slate? How cool is that? So I made a custom stencil on my Cricut machine and then I placed it onto my piece of slate. Then I used Armor Etch Cream and I generously applied it over the area we were etching and then I let it sit for 15 minutes.
then we're going to just want to scrape off as much as you can with your foam brush and then put the excess back into the jar and you can reuse it on another project then any remaining that you weren't able to get off with your brush you can just wipe off with a paper towel and then take it to your sink and you'll probably want to wear rubber gloves for this but use some soap and water to wash off the final residue now before I show you the slate piece, I decided to attach some handles to the wood part that I had picked up from Hobby Lobby to make it easier to carry. It also adds a little bit more interest too, in my opinion. Now I was gonna screw it on with a drill, but the screws I was using were a little too tiny and I, so I had to do it by hand. But it really wasn't as bad as you would think. Now this piece had been clearly passed over many times based on how much dust was on it. <laughs> but I bought it for $5 and our made over version could easily sell for in the ballpark of around $40 or so. And it's so beautiful. Isn't this a great gift idea? So if you ever happen to come upon something like this covered in dust, just know that it might be a real diamond in the rough. I hope you're enjoying this episode so far. Our next DIY is this candlestick that I found at that same thrift store. <laughs> it was beautiful. I loved it, but there was only one and I usually like to have them in sets of two or three. And so I wanted to do something a little bit different. So we are gonna do an arrangement on top. This is pretty easy to put together and you can use your own creativity on this. I will give you a couple of pointers that I think might be helpful. I start by attaching the piece of floral foam that I picked up at the Dollar Tree and I hot glue mine into place with some Gorilla Glue. Because if I really wanted to, I can pop it off later down the road. But you feel free to use some floral tape as well if you'd like. And then I just start out with some English Ivy and I want some pieces to kind of dangle and waterfall down in kind of a soft romantic way. And then I just use a mixture of a lot of greens and whites. And I want you want to make sure you have varying heights and varying textures and that's what makes it really beautiful and you kind of want to create an arrangement in a manner that you would see it in nature and not something that is very stiff and perfect looking there is a time and a place for those types of arrangements but generally speaking you just kind of want things to have some variation and variety in them now I used a mixture of florals that I picked up from Michaels and the Dollar Tree and this didn't take me long to assemble at all It's just a fun, different idea of something that you can do with a random candlestick that doesn't have a mate. Or you could do this on one that does have a mate and have two. <laughs> I think I spent $7 on the candlestick itself and probably around $20 or so in florals. I can see this being really beautiful at a wedding or even just for your everyday decor. I found this jewelry box at that thrift store. It had a really cool texture to it, but it was kind of dated. So we are gonna give it a cement like. Now this project is probably the easiest of them all. I saw this at the thrift shop and I thought the color was like a swamp like green and not very attractive at all but I loved the shape and the detailing on it and I thought that we could give it a new life by giving it a faux concrete look. We did this by painting it out in a warm gray color. Now, when I put this first coat on of gray, I thought it was a little bit too light in color. So I went back in and mixed in a darker gray with the original color. And to be honest with you, I think I could have even gone a little darker than I did, but I decided to go with this. Now, the secret to giving it that kind of faux concrete look is to very carefully dry brush on some white chalk paint. And sometimes when I was doing this, I felt like I got a little too heavy on the white chalk paint and then I would just go back in with some of that darker gray color and just kind of keep playing around with it until I was happy with the look and, and that's how you would do it as well. It's a very easy process and it totally transformed the way this little jewelry box looks. I spent five dollars on the jewelry box and then with just a a little touch of paint it makes this piece into something so beautiful and that i would be happy to display in my bedroom or even possibly give as a gift 
but what do you think? I have probably for the past year or two been salivating on Pinterest over all of these beautiful French scroll farmhouse tables. They are amazing, they are beautiful, and they're very expensive. So I've just been dreaming about how I could get one of these French scroll tables forever. And then one day, a few months ago, I walked into a thrift store and my jaw hit the floor because I saw this beautiful table and it was marked for $75, which is a massive savings over what I'd been seeing on Pinterest. So it needs a little bit of a makeover, a little bit of love, but the lines are beautiful. It's gorgeous. It must be pretty old. The finish is mostly worn off. The table actually extends pretty far and becomes a massive table because the leaves actually sit underneath this top piece, which is awesome, but then it tucks away and it's a, a normal size table. If you've ever refinished a dining room table before and had to sand and it is quite the job <laughs> because if you don't sand it down to the bare wood like everywhere and you miss a spot when you go to stain it it just looks weird it doesn't work out right but I wanted to try something a little bit different because I did these candlesticks a couple of months ago on an episode and I'll link it down below if you're interested and it was kind of like a lime wash and it really took some ugly wood and turned it into a really cool finish and I decided I wanted to try that on the top part of my table. This technique will allow me to not sand it down as much because we're gonna be using some antiquing waxes and some paint and just kind of giving it this limed aged look that you'd see on a lot of these tables anyways. And we're gonna try this technique on the tabletop. What do you think of that finish? Pretty cool, right? The good news with this technique is you don't have to be as meticulous as you would need if you were going to be staining it a different color or anything like that. You won't get that tiger striping. So we're gonna just take this outside and sand it, give it a pretty decent sanding. We don't have to be too crazy, but just sand away. And I'm gonna use an electric sander. So let's get sanded. Before we paint, we need to do a little prep. Make sure to tape off any areas you don't need to paint, and then we are gonna take plastic and cover areas that we don't want paint to get on either. All right, so I'm getting ready to paint this and I've decided to use a paint sprayer and some oops paint that I lucked out on several months ago. I got some white oops paint that almost never happens, but I did. And I've used it on a couple of things and I've got plenty of it here. No rhyme or reason why I'm using it over chalk paint other than I have it on hand. And it's gonna be on the bottom side. If it gets scuffed up or, or banged up, we're gonna be distressing it anyway. So I think it will be fine. And I'm gonna use my new paint sprayer that I got off of Amazon. It's a handy little tool. It's awesome. And the reason why I'm doing that is I think it's going to dry faster and I'm also going to be able to get a nice smooth finish. I actually picked up a bench at Hobby Lobby that matches it really good. It has like the same lines and everything. We're going to be using it with the table and it's already painted white. So this is perfect. To use the paint sprayer, I put a couple of tablespoons of water in here, not much, just to thin it out a little bit because the paint is rather thick. We'll go ahead and pour it into here. And then the lid, it comes separately like this and then you just twist it on and then once it's on, then we can connect it to the main body. So it's kind of like a three step process. It's actually really simple to use. One of the reasons I'm doing this inside and not outside is because it's pretty humid outside right now. That kind of makes for some complications when you're painting. Over 60% humidity creates problems when you're painting. So I just decided to do this. This paint sprayer doesn't go crazy. It doesn't have a lot of overspray, but I kind of went overboard anyways with the plastic. I protected my 
my chandelier and everything behind me, but I think that will be just fine. I put plastic over this rug even though it is on its last leg and will probably be replaced shortly. In the meantime, I didn't want it to look totally nasty, so we covered that up as well. And then we will start spraying, and it's gonna be a lot of fun. <laughs> and it's gonna make the process go a lot faster. Here we go. All right, time for coat number two, flipped over. I'm really happy with how this is looking so far. I'm gonna actually let the base dry overnight before I do any distressing. But in the meantime, it's dry enough that we can proceed with our next step. Now, this tabletop would never be sanded sufficiently if we were going to be staining it. If you wanna stain the top of this, you need to get it all the way down to the bare wood. But for what we're doing, this is just fine and it's sanded enough that we can proceed. I'm really excited to try this technique and to be able to see if it will work without having to sand everything down. I figure worst case scenario, if it doesn't work, then I sand it all the way down and stain it. I mean, it wouldn't be the end of the world. It would be a little bit extra work, but I have have a sneaking suspicion that this is gonna work out just fine. We're gonna start this process. I'm taking some folk art antiquing wax and I'm gonna put some in this bowl here and then we're gonna take a cheap chip brush like you don't need to spend a ton of money on this I promise because for what we're doing it's this will be just fine we're gonna just dab it on some paper towel and have a paper plate underneath there and then we're gonna kind of just dry brush it onto our tabletop and so we're gonna just do that to the entire top and once we get it on there we're gonna quickly then take kind of a wet washcloth and like blend it out a little bit so it's not like a harsh look but more kind of like a, a washed look so we're gonna just keep doing this on the entire top. By the time it's all said and done, we will have only used maybe a couple tablespoons of this white chalk paint on the entire top. So it really takes hardly anything to make a difference. And we're just taking it and very dryly brushing it on and then we're gonna wipe it off with a wet washcloth and kind of just tone down the look that way. We're going with the grain of the wood, whether that goes this way, in some cases it goes this way, in some cases it goes this way, and then we're just gonna dry brush it on and then wipe it off and do the entire table. All right, now we're gonna just lightly distress the edges with some regular sandpaper. I would not recommend Dollar Tree sandpaper. It kind of shreds. Go get some real stuff. <laughs> We're almost done. 
My last step is I'm gonna finish this top with a finishing wax for two reasons. First off, it's a little too humid outside for me to do a polyurethane or a, some kind of lacquer finish. And my bathroom that I usually use for these type of circumstances is not big enough for this dining table. And the second reason is, is because knowing me, I like to change my dining tables. And so this finishing wax will work perfectly if for some reason, I get bored and change my mind. I had one dining table that I think I changed like seven or eight times. But I'm really happy with this look for now and we're just gonna get this on. Okay, so this is as simple as wax on, wax off. So we're just gonna put it on, leave it on for, I think it's like five minutes or so. Let me see, what does it say? Five to 10 minutes. <laughs> and then we'll come back and wipe it off. So just get a generous amount and start working it into our table. And this will just provide a protective layer for it. And then if you need to reapply this down the road, it's a pretty easy process if you feel like it needs another layer. I am thrilled with the final results. It was probably one of the easiest refinishes I've done on a dining room table, and redoing a thrift store version of my Pinterest-inspired dining table saved me thousands of dollars in the end. You gotta love that. The bench that I got at Hobby Lobby matches extremely well. And now it's time to make over the dining chairs that I'm gonna put with this table. I found some real, authentic Pottery Barn dining chairs, normally $249 for $20 a piece on Facebook Marketplace. I got a thousand dollars worth of Pottery Barn chairs for $80. Now the chair itself is very sturdy and good condition. The wood finish on it is not terrible. I mean, it does have some nicks and dings. I could go about just kind of restoring the wood finish that's on there. However, with what I've got going on with kitchen cabinets and my fireplace mantle and the finish on this, I just felt like there were too many different woods. Plus, I have some bar stools right next to this dining table that kind of have a black wash finish on them. And so that's what I'm gonna be doing today. These chairs have been discontinued on the Pottery Barn website. It almost looks like they just lined it and then they didn't actually upholster it. The fabric that they used was like a cream color. It was very thin. And so the, there's a lot of worn down spots on these chairs and it just didn't hold up very well. And I think that that's why they were discontinued just because of their fabric selection. you to know before we start out is this is a very forgiving technique so it's really hard to mess up. I've got a jar of black chalk paint here that I've mixed with about three quarters chalk paint and a quarter water. And then you're gonna wanna dampen your brush beforehand, not sopping wet, just get it a little wet and then squeeze as much water out of it as possible. This will help kind of the chalk paint from drying on as you do this process. We're gonna dip our paintbrush in it and then wipe off quite a lot of it. And so there's not a lot on here. And we're gonna just start going to town and we're gonna just kind of feather it on. If there's like an imperfect area, you might wanna hit that with a little bit more paint and a little bit heavier. And then, and then you can just keep working on it as you go. And we have a damp rag with us and you'll see why we need that in a second. Kind of get in this keyhole area. And then I feel like I got it a little heavier than I want here, so we can just kind of dab some of it off here and then kind of 
feather it out kind of in a crisscross because you don't want harsh lines but you do kind of want it to look like natural wear and tear then that looks really good so some of the wood is showing through there and then just in areas that you want to rework just dab it with a wet cloth and kind of feather it out like i said this is really a forgiving process and a little paint goes a long way so we're just going to kind of go at this for a while in some of those areas where we know that there's going to be natural tear just kind of wipe it off while it's wet and then you can always come back in even after it's dry and kind of wipe or add as needed so we want some of the wood to show but I'm looking for more of an opaque look than a stained look, so just strategic showing. If you're a sloppy painter, this is the technique for you. <laughs> if there's any like dings or dents or scratches, this is a good way to hide those. It's a wonderful technique, I love this. And as you can see, I haven't re-dipped this in a while and, it, and we've been able to get quite a bit of coverage out of just the one dip. Now I'm getting ready to needing to dip it again, but as you can see, we're gonna not need very much paint to get the job done. Get all the little nooks and crannies and, and then have some areas that are like natural wear and tear. Okay, we're gonna re-dip here and then we're gonna wipe a lot of it off. You can be super messy with this. <laughs> And this will be kind of a very similar look to the existing black one that was for sale through Pottery Barn. And you can see that this is kind of drying off and if you wanna pull some of it off, you can still do it and then feather it out. So we're just kind of feathering out some of these brush strokes. This is honestly probably one of the most forgiving techniques I've ever worked with. So I'm really liking this. It's beautiful, beautiful, rich black color. If you've got too much paint on your brush, you kind of just spread the love <laughs> all over and then you can come and feather it out when your brush is a little bit drier. So just keep working on it until you're happy with the way it looks and then you're gonna let it dry for about one to two hours. So I tried waxing the chairs, but the finish ended up being uneven and kind of blotchy. Some of it was shiny, some of it was still flat. So I'm just gonna go ahead and use this Watco Crystal Clear Lacquer Finish it's in satin. I don't want it to be super glossy, but just a nice, beautiful finished sheen. And we're gonna just do some light coats and let it dry. And it's actually not too humid today for once. <laughs> These seat cushions actually look grosser than they really are. They've been steam cleaned and these stains are just stubborn, but they will be good as new in no time once we are through. I had some white denim left over from some slip covers that I made for some chairs in Maine. It actually washes up very nice, so I'm hoping for a similar effect on these seat cushions. Now, I ripped them to 26 by 26 inch squares, large enough to cover each cushion. Since the chairs and the table are already kind of a French country look, we are going to keep with that look by adding some French stripes. Kind of just follow along what I'm doing here, but I'm actually creating a wide middle stripe and two smaller side stripes. Now for the paint. I went to the Home Depot and picked up a sample paint, which is more than plenty to paint on our stripes. The paint color's name is Fresh Artichoke, and I had it mixed in a satin finish. I paint it directly onto the denim being careful around the edges as to not get too much leakage seeping underneath the tape and once our green is on i pull the tape right up i don't even wait for it to dry you want to be careful though while the paint is drying i find a French label off of graphicsfairy.com that I liked and then I uploaded it into my Cricut Design Studio after removing the background. I adjusted the size and duplicated it so there was four of them and then I cut it out of heat transfer vinyl. Then 
Then of course I remove the excess that I don't want and cut them apart. Then I just use my easy press for 20 seconds on the front side and 15 seconds on the back. Let it cool for a few seconds, peel it back and voila, beautiful. Then we are going to staple this on to each cushion. I work in a north, south, east, west pattern, working from the center out. And then I try to wrap each corner similar to how I would wrap a present. And you may want to cut off any excess that will block your way to the screw holes. Using the electric staple gun makes it so much easier and makes quick work of it. Now, one might think I have gone and done lost my marbles for putting white canvas on my dining room chairs with two little boys at home. We are going to put two coats of the Scotch Guard on, and I figure if my boys can't manage themselves, there's always a wood bench that they can sit on. And plus, covering dining room chair seats is pretty simple and so if push comes to shove I will recover them so let's put this scotch guard on we're gonna do it really good <laughs> I am just thrilled with how my Pottery Barn chairs turned out. They look amazing. They're classy and they look like I got them from Pottery Barn, except for with a cuter seat, a cuter cushion, <laughs> and that's not bad. You know, we'll see how these white cushions turn out. I might be a little nutty for doing it, but we'll see. Maybe they'll hold up and if not, it's just an easy switch for me. I hope you've seen that it's not that hard to change out the fabric on your seat cushions in your dining room easy switch. I went to a little extra effort to make mine customized, but you could just put on some fabric and it would be super easy to do. So for about $25 a piece, I have a beautiful, authentic Pottery Barn chairs that look a lot better than when I picked them up and I'm just thrilled. So I picked up this dresser for $50 off of Facebook Marketplace. It was such a score. At first glance, you look at it and you're like, it doesn't really need anything. It's gorgeous. It's a beautiful piece. But upon closer inspection, you'll notice that there's a little bit of wear and tear from kids. Some scratches, some nicks, some dings. This drawer right here, it's got some issues. <laughs> so we're gonna try to, yeah, I can't even close it. <laughs> we're gonna try to repair that. As you can see, I've already got my TV sitting on it. Um, we're gonna be using it as a TV stand. Now, a lot of people's inclination is to paint everything. And I actually don't want to paint this. In fact, my plan is to not paint it, but there is some pretty significant scratching on it that we do need to address and I thought that I would take the opportunity to darken it up just a touch very strategically because I actually really like the finish. It's got some really cool features, some white wax on it that kind of offers a lot of interest and detail. But I thought if we were really strategic, we could darken up some specific areas so that we can draw some of the darkness of my kitchen cabinets that are right over here and some darkness of my fireplace mantle that's right over here and kind of bring it into this. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> I mean, I don't have an exact plan for how to do this, but I think it's gonna be an amazing piece. So let's get started on it. So normally I would tell you to take this outside and do this outside, but it is 39 degrees here in Florida, which is basically freezing. Well, it's pretty much close to freezing anywhere, but that's really, really cold here in Florida. So we're gonna have to do this inside. We're gonna be careful. My kids are at school. When it warms up a little bit later in the day, I will open everything up and air it out really, really good. But the first thing we're gonna do is repair that wobbly drawer. So you can see here, that this is off and that's what's going on. So we need to kind of reinstall this so that it will open and close properly, but that's a pretty easy repair. But it's got a problem here because this is cracked and so that's loose. So we're gonna need to put a little wood glue and a clamp on that so that it can dry so that we can properly track 
this drawer. So once we put on a little wood glue, I kind of spread that cracked wood open a little bit and kind of push it down with my finger. And then I take a clamp and clamp it into place. And that piece of wood that I'm putting behind it is there just to kind of distribute the pressure evenly along the cracked area. And then I let it dry. We've let this dry overnight, so we're gonna release it. <laughs> that doesn't want to come off. There we go. Almost looks like it was never even broken. So now we are going to screw this back into place. Once we screw this back into place, then we'll have a functioning drawer, hopefully. We'll just stick that screw into here. Okay, and then we need to put one in the back there. We're gonna take some sandpaper, and I'm, I've got two grits here. I've got 120 grit for kind of some of the deeper scratches. I'm not gonna use this very much. And then I've got a thousand grit, which is basically like wet sandpaper. And the reason I'm gonna just use this is just to get a very fine roughness so that it will take the gel stain a little bit better. On this drawer, you can see some heavy scratching, including a smiley face. A happy little reminder of being loved by kids. But I want to remove some of these heavy scratches, so I take the 120 grit sandpaper and sand a few strategic places. Remove a sticker from the side, and then I give a good wet sand to the entire piece with 1000 grit sandpaper. So you can kind of see that I've done a light sanding on most the entire thing and then like heavier sanding in certain spots that kind of needed a little bit more. Now that we've got it kind of scuffed up on the entirety, I'm gonna just take some window cleaner. I use Method Peppermint because it smells really good and it works also really good. So I'm just gonna spray this on all of it and then wipe it down with a microfiber cloth and that will kind of grab the dust and then if there's any areas that need a little bit finer grit, we will go over that because I can already see that there is. And then we will let it fully dry before applying some gel stain. So for this next part, I would absolutely recommend doing this outside, in a garage, whatever. I don't really have the option today. We're gonna gel stain this right here. And I have protected the floors by putting plastic down and then I also did some brown paper over the top of that just as like a double assurance that I don't get any of this gel stain on my floor. So I've got gloves on. And I'm gonna be using this Kona gel stain. This Kona gel stain is the same one that I've used on my fireplace mantle. So I really am hoping this darkens up the wood just a touch. Let's start right here on the top. And then always with the grain of the wood. And I think this is gonna look so pretty. And the nice thing about gel stain is it kind of acts a little bit more like a paint while still showing the wood grain. So this will be great. Let's do this. <laughs> I'm gonna not even push this down into the grooves here so we can see some of that detailing still. When staining, even with gel stain, rub it on in the direction of the wood grain and it will save yourself a whole bunch of headache. <laughs> Now it was at this point when I regretted sanding down these particular areas with the heavier grit sandpaper. And I wished that I had just done a wet sand only because the gel stain had much better coverage over the top of the existing stain than I thought it would. And it would have been just fine. And what I did ended up creating some unevenness in my stain, which ended up creating more work for me in the end. So lesson learned. If I were to do this again, I would have just wet sanded the whole thing and then used the gel stain to cover up the big scratches. So you live and you learn. <laughs> Thank you.
Now you want to allow at least 24, possibly 48 hours for the gel stain to dry before applying your polyurethane. I ended up using the wipe on polyurethane and I had to do four coats of it. Yes, four coats. I think I could have gotten away with two had I not done those sanded down spots, but in those areas, it created a little rough spot and it was really obvious. But once I did the four coats, it eventually disguised and evened out the finish. to satin polyurethane and this doesn't look very satin to me actually it looks pretty glossy but in the end I am really happy with the final result I think it's just gorgeous you could easily spend $1,000 in a store for this piece all day long but I spent just $50 plus a little in supplies that I already had on hand and the results are stunning what do you think if you enjoyed this episode, here's another one that I think you'll like as well. And if you haven't done so already, consider hitting that subscribe button right there. It's super easy to do. And I would love it if you joined the DIY Niner family and to all of my DIY Niners, I just want to remind you that you are more powerful than you know. We'll see you next time. Bye.